So, um, in our in fourth year in our medical school, we teach our students uh, how to approach to clinical medicine or introduction to clinical medicine. أنا دائما بقول لطلبة سنة رابعة إنه أهم كورس حضراتكم بتاخدوه هو Introduction to Clinical Medicine ده اللي أنتوا هتشتغلوا بيه في الـ Early Years of, uh, of Clinical Practice وبالتالي هو أهم uh, كورس بالنسبة للـ GB والـ ABCs of Introduction to Clinical Medicine is Taking a Good History and Generating a Differential Diagnosis Then Applying Physical Examination or Medical Examination whether it is local or systemic, and then refining the differential diagnosis. And lastly, based on the differential diagnosis, I would go to the lab, or maybe I would go to the imaging. I would order investigations to minimize the differential diagnosis into a final, most probable diagnosis. This is the approach to clinical medicine. However, currently we have a parallel line of medicine, which we may call the folk medicine. So in Egypt, the folk medicine depends on three pillars, at least currently, this is, this is my view. The first is the pharmacist. So we have many pharmacists or those who work in a pharmacy that dare to diagnose and prescribe medications to patients who are actually satisfied with the advice of a pharmacist. And the second pillar would be Google consultations because you know that nowadays everyone is consulting Google about his symptoms and maybe he would receive a diagnosis and treatment coming from Google. And lastly, WhatsApp. WhatsApp, which is supposed to be a social uh, media uh, program to communicate with each other, is now being used to circulate tests, whether it is imaging or lab reports to receive consultations online. So actually my task today is to show to you that it is the clinical medicine is the proper way of diagnosing a patient and it should not be the folk medicine that we should use. So before going this, I just want you to see this WhatsApp message. So what would you do if you have this WhatsApp message? So you have a TSH of uh, uh, 0.01, a suppressed TSH, and a free T4 that is higher normal, 1.8, and it shouldn't exceed 1.9. So a picture that's consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism. And you can see the comment for the patient, Dr. Munkin Tiktibli Aileg Ala Tahlil Da. So first, this is part of the folk medicine that I have called, and actually, we have summarized all the clinical medicine into just looking at the lab, which is not consistent with what we teach our students in the faculty. So actually, before looking into the lab report, you should have proper history taking and you should have proper clinical examination and then you should order investigations and then you should analyze all of this and then take a decision. I'm going to describe to you six different interpretations to the same set of tests that I have shown you. Starting with this uh, case scenario, a female, 25 years of age, she complained of hair fall. She has gone to her dermatologist, and, uh, uh, which he asked for thyroid profile. The thyroid profile came out identical to this one that I have shown you. The TSH was suppressed. The free T4 was high normal. He also ordered TSH receptor antibodies to diagnose graves, and here you see it is markedly elevated above the detection limit. For history and examination for this patient, she has no symptoms suggestive of hyperthyroidism. She has no signs suggestive of hyperthyroidism. She has no family history of thyroid disease. She is not currently on medications. Actually, she was asked, what are the medications that you take? But then when she was asked, do you take anything else? Then she has uh, uh, described that she has self-prescribed biotin, 10 milligrams per day. Why didn't you mention it in the medications? Because simply, I don't consider this a medication. Based, so who prescribed this? I self-prescribed it. On what advice? Based on recommendations from numerous websites on hair care. So it was a Google description. 
So what is biotin and what does it have to do with the prison, the, the prison problem? Biotin is a water soluble vitamin. It is also called vitamin B7 or vitamin H. It is found in foods such as eggs, cereals, DV green vegetables. It is also found in multivitamin substance uh, supplement preparations at low doses, usually ranging from 30 to 500 micrograms. The recommended daily intake of biotin is only 30 micrograms, which most people can easily obtain from the diet. It also has medical uses other than repleting a deficient patient. So it's per day, milligrams per day, which is about 500 times the RDI. It is used in hair or nail disorders, for example, brittle nail syndrome, starting from 10 and up to 30 milligrams per day, which represents 300 and up to 1,000 times the recommended daily intake. It is also used in progressive multiple sclerosis and biotin responsive basal ganglia disease at very mega doses, 100 to 300 milligrams per day, which is about 10,000 times the recommended daily intake, and some inherited metabolic diseases at lower doses, starting from five and up to 30 or 40 milligrams per day. So again, what does biotin have to do with this? So you have to know about what is called biotin, streptavidine immobilization system. This is called, uh, this is used in immunoassays. So why do we use biotin and the so-called streptavidine? So the interaction between biotin and streptavidine is one of the strongest known non-covalent interactions between a protein and a ligand. This bone is formed rapidly and it resists temperature, pH and denaturating agents. It has a small size and it possesses a side chain that it will make it suitable for labeling or marking. So we use biotin and streptavidine in immunoassays to measure hormones. So biotin represent a lab interference. Actually, a daily dose of five milligrams or more can lead to interference with numerous analytes using the biotin streptavidine based assays. Up till now, 27 cases have reported of biotin interference with endocrine function testing in 20 published papers. This has led to a misdiagnosis in the range of hyperparathyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, hyperestrogenemia, and testosterone secreting tumor. However, the most common misdiagnosis in 25 out of 27 cases was Graves' disease. So this is an example. This was a case series. This was six children that were taking biotin to treat some inherited inborn errors of metabolism. And when they measured the thyroid function test for these six children, you can see here, look at, at during biotin treatment. During biotin treatment, they exhibited a very high free T4, ranging from 6.2 to 7.7. .7. They exhibited a markedly suppressed TSH down to 0.02. Uh, uh, and also they exhibited a very high TSH receptor antibodies uh, uh, from 38 to, to more than 40. A picture consisted with a diagnosis of Graves' disease. These six children were only asked to stop biotin and then repeating the tests two to seven days later, you can see that the TSH rose up to normal levels or maybe up to hypothyroid levels, the free T4 gone down to normal levels up to 1.113, and all the trap tests came out negative. Unfortunately, these patients, based on the assumption that they have Graves' disease, not half of these patients actually received unnecessary carbimazole or methimazole treatment. So how would biotin interfere with the, uh, uh, the determination of TSH and free T4. First, we have two types of assays. The first, which is non-competitive sandwich assays. So example of sandwich assays is the TSH assay. So we have the, uh, the analyte, the TSH. We add uh, uh, labeled antibodies specific for TSH and we add 
biotinylated, biotinylated uh, uh, antibodies specific for TSH. These three will form sandwiches, as you can see. So the antibody with the marker above and the biotin related antibody would be below and both they would sandwich the TSH and then they would bind to streptavidine because as I told you, there is a very high affinity of biotin to streptavidine. So this would be the picture. The uh, uh, sandwiched uh, TSH would bind to streptavidine and in this type of assays, the TSH concentration is directly proportional to the signal that is generated by the marker. What happens if we add to this picture a lot of biotin. So patients making, taking mega doses of biotin starting from five milligrams and up to 300 milligrams. So if you had this biotin, it would compete with the sandwiches for uh, uh, binding with the streptavidine. And so you will get this picture instead of the one that I've shown you before. And so the presence of biotin in the blood would decrease, falsely decrease the TSH. So this is how a biotin would produce suppressed TSH. So how would biotin produce high 3T4? So this is another type of assays that we call competitive assays. So for example, of competitive assays is the 3T4 and the TRAP, the TSH receptor antibody assays. So we have the analyte, the 3T4, and then we add marker, uh, market antibodies, which form complexes of market antibodies and 3T4. The remaining antibodies, then we add the biotinylated ligand. So we add T4 that is bound to biotin. And this biotinylated 3T4 is going to bind to the remaining marked antibodies, forming also sandwiches. And these sandwiches is going to bind to streptavidine. However, here, after removal of the 3T4, the endogenous 3T4, only the sandwiches would remain. And that is why 3T4 concentration here is inversely proportional. So our analyte, the TSH in the patient's blood, would bind first to the antibodies, and then the remaining antibodies would bound to biotinylated 3T4. And then the biotinylated 3T4 is going to bind. And that is why the smaller the signal, the higher is the 3T4. If I add biotin, it would compete with the complexes, and so it would prevent the biotinylated ligand from binding to streptavidine. This would produce a very low signal that is going to give a very high 3T4 and a very high TSH receptor antibodies. That is why for 3T4 and traps in the, in the patients that I have shown you, it was out of limit, out of boundary. How to approach a case of suspected biotin interference? Actually, we have a number of actions, the only logical of which would be going to this uh, marked uh, rectangle. So you have one of two ways, either ask the patient to stop biotin supplementation and then repeat the test using the original method or repeat the test using alternate method. And actually, for this patient, we have chosen to go for this, the first way. So the patient was advised to stop biotin supplement. The tests were repeated. TSH and 3T4 normalized within 48 hours. TRAPS normalized in up to seven days. Actually, the patient came out to be eothyroid, and simply this is a case of biotin interference. Simply, this is a lab bit full. She does not deserve to, to take any treatment. Again, to the same numbers, again, to the similar patient, sending the same test and asking for treatment. So this is actually one of my patients that I have shown in my, in my clinic. So he's a male, 27 years of age. His weight is 63 kilograms. He suffered from acute hyponatremia. Actually, this patient uh, was not an Egyptian patient. He was first admitted to uh, emergency hospital in his country. He was stabilized and he was discharged and he preferred to, to seek medical advice in Egypt.
by the time he reached Egypt, he, uh, he uh, experienced the same presentation, acute hyponatremia, and he was admitted to hospital and they started to investigate him. So these tests were asked. So cortisol AM was markedly low. ACTH was inappropriately low, consistent with secondary adrenal insufficiency. The free T4 was markedly low. However, the TSH was inappropriately normal, a picture consistent with central hypothyroidism. So what are the biochemical profiles that is consistent with central hypothyroidism? Definitely the classic one, the one that we teach for our students in medical school, low free T4, low TSH, plus or minus low free T3, because the conversion of T4 into T3 by D2 may preserve T3 to the last. Patients who present with such a presentation, low free T3, low free T4, low TSH, should systematically be screened for severe disease at the time of hormone assessment because this can be confused with severe non-thyroidal illness. A free T4 to free T3 uh, ratio of less than two suggests low T3 syndrome. A free T3 to free T4 ratio greater than two would suggest central hypothyroidism. This was uh, proved in a study that included patients who were only less than 18 years of age. But this is not the only uh, biochemical profile for central hypothyroidism. Here you would find two other profiles for central hypothyroidism. You may find low free T4. This is a must to diagnose a patient with central hypothyroidism with inappropriate normal TSH or you may find a patient with low free T4 plus inappropriate, in, inappropriately high TSH. So how come in a patient with central hypothyroidism, we have a defect in the pituitary or the hypothalamus or both, that we have TSH within normal or maybe even high? Because these patients have qualitative defects in the TSH molecule. These qualitative defects cause two things. The first, the ability of these uh, defected TSH to stimulate TSH receptor is decreased. However, they, still, they are still immunoreactive, and so they can be detected by immunoassays. Again, this defect leads to decreased clearance, and that is why you may have either appropriate, inappropriately normal TSH or maybe increased TSH. Actually, this may be a surprise to some of you, the classic teaching for central hypothyroidism is that you would find low free T4, low TSH. So in these two studies, they saw to see the TSH value distribution in central hypothyroidism. The first study included 40 patients and the second study for included 50 patients. You can see that in the first study, only 12% of the patients have suppressed TSH. 17% have raised TSH and the majority of whom 70% had normal TSH. In the second study, only 8% have suppressed TSH, 8% have raised TSH, and the majority of whom 80% had normal TSH. So actually, TSH distribution in central hypothyroidism is actually as follows and 70 to 80 percent inappropriately normal TSH. So you should uh, put this in your mind. So in order to differentiate between a patient with central hypothyroidism with either normal or slightly raised TSH and to differentiate him from a patient with subclinical hypothyroidism, this study was tried. So in 55% and 55 patients with central hypothyroidism, the free T4 was always low, but the TSH range from uh, markedly suppressed TSH to 20. So how to differentiate in a patient with hypothyroxinemia? If the TSH is less than 10, this confirms central hypothyroidism with a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 100%. If you have a patient with hypothyroxinemia with a TSH more than 25, this is confirmative of primary hypothyroidism with a sensitivity of 
and specificity of one hundred. So if you have a place in the in the MRI, um, there is central, uh, central and second stoke. There is convexity of the upper border uh, uh, of the pituitary. There is a diffuse enlargement, and there are no filling defects that would be explained as adenoma. So the differential diagnosis for my patient was autoimmune hypophysitis, histiocytosis, X, or sarcoidosis. For the treatment, he was started on replacement therapy for adrenal insufficiency, prednisolone 5 milligrams per day, and levothyroxine 100 micrograms per day, and he returned it with these tests. Free T4 of 1.8, TSH of uh, uh, 0.01, and all uh, sodium concentration. So the target of treatment for a And here in fact, use lean with concentration within two to four hours after ingestion. It is recommended to perform the blood test either before the ingestion of levothyroxine tap. C3 or three have a rule in follow up of a patient with central hypothyroidism. Some patients on levothyroxine replacement can have high normal free four. This is an evidence demonstrating origin of T3 is useful in a patient with central hypothyroidism. Only to exclude a case of suspected overtreatment. Replacement, you would find T3 to be less than 0.5 milli international unit per liter. In patients who have inappropriate elevate to above one milli international unit per liter. So actually, measurement of TSH in a patient with central hypothyroidism is useful only to exclude the suspected case of undertreatment. And definitely, this will not be useful in patients who have suppressed TSH at the time of their diagnosis. When to suspect insufficient replacement therapy in central hypothyroidism, if you have the free T4, below or close to the lower limit of normal range, especially if the TSH is more than one with persistent hypothyroid manifestations. When to suspect levothyroxine overtreatment in a patient with central hypothyroidism, if you find the free T4 above or close to the upper limit of normal with thyrotoxic manifestations with or without high T3 and free T3 concentration. So, the second patient presented with the same set of tests is simply a case of well-replaced central hypothyroidism, and he does not require any modification of the treatment. Again, the same set of tests and the same question by another patient. Would you, would you prescribe treatment for me? So this is a female patient, 30 years of age, presenting with a nodular goiter on ultrasound, as you can see. She had a multinodular goiter. This is the dominant nodule. The largest is two centimeters in diameter. It has a regular border. It is taller than white, and it exhibits microcalcification. And there is also pathological lymph nodes. All are conditions that necessitate the fine needle aspiration cytology came with the Pisista class six which means that we are sure that this patient has uh, a papillary thyroid carcinoma with uh, 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 a risk of malignancy of 97, 97 to 
percent. So the patient had total thyroidectomy with therapeutic and prophylactic neck dissection. The biliary thyroid carcinoma with gross extrathyroidal extension is the final diagnosis. She received radioactive iodine ablation with a dose of 100 millicurie. What is the risk of recurrence for such a patient having macroscopic invasion of the tumor into the peripheral soft tissues or gross extrathyroidal extension both this patient in ATA, American Thyroid Association, high risk of recurrence. Accordingly, what would be the target TSH? The target TSH would be suppressing TSH to below 0.1 million international unit per liter, which is a strong recommendation with moderate quality of evidence. So our patient received suppressive levothyroxine therapy. The target for the treatment was TSH less than 0.1 based on her weight. She was 70 kilograms, and because this is a suppressive dose programs multiplied by the body weight, and this monitor peak out with the tests that I have viewed to you. So, yes, properly suppressed to below point H in the carcinoma. She has the association high risk for recurrence. The initial suppression required for such a patient would be to reach this now adequately suppressed. So the patient is doesn't have any anything wrong with her treatment. Not sure how many of you uh, two months ago, and uh, actually one of the speakers was Susan Mandel. Susan Mandel uh, actually uh, told some news about the new guidelines of the American Thyroid Association for number one thyroid nodules and number two differentiated thyroid carcinoma. One of the news that she has announced is that they are going to have two guidelines, one for management of thyroid nodules and the other for differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And the second, she she have this displayed that uh, that she mentioned that most response to the thyroidectomy uh, with or without radioactive iodine. This was not mentioned in the 2016 guidelines. So, what is the target for uh, uh, thyroglobulin if I have thyroidectomy without radioactive? By the ablation. And what is the target of thyroglobulin if I had only lobectomy without definitely radioactive iodine ablation? So you can see here that they, they have cutoff limits to determine excellent response and biochemical incomplete response for these two categories that were not mentioned in the 2016 guidelines. Also, I expect that we are going to see also different targets for TSH. Uh, uh, during the management of differentiated thyroid carcinoma based on the response. And so for an excellent response, we know that we should go for a TSH uh, uh, target of 0.5 to 2. But for indeterminate and biochemically complete response, you are going to target 0.5 to 1. And this is a new target that was not mentioned in the previous guidelines. So we are actually anticipating the new guidelines to know more uh, about the new management of uh, uh, thyroid cancer. Again, back to the same set of tests and another patient asking the same question to prescribe uh, medications uh, through the WhatsApp. So this time, uh, the patient is a female, 28 years of age. After a mess period, she had a pregnancy test. So her first pregnancy was diagnosed and after visiting her ob -GYN, she, uh, he ordered the thyroid profile, the TSH was suppressed and the free T4 was 1.8. The, the set of tests that was sent you on WhatsApp and for an endocrinologist for a proper management. The differential diagnosis for such uh, a presentation is either number one, gestational transient thyroid Graves disease, toxic nodular goiter, or a toxic phase 
to have measurement of T3s may be helpful to clarify the etiology of thyrotoxicosis. This was a strong recommendation. Definitely, a set of tests that you can use to uh, to uh, diagnose a patient with subclinical hyperthyroidism during the first uh, trimester of pregnancy will not include scintigraphy or radioactive iodine uptake. And this is a strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. So, starting history and examination for the patient, the patient complained only of palpitations. She had no prior history of thyroid disease. She has no stigmata of Graves' disease, neither goiter, neither orbitopathy, and she also mentioned severe vomiting. All of these is, is in favor of the diagnosis of gestational transient thyrotoxicosis. Measurement of TRAB is indicated to exclude Graves, and the thyroid ultrasound should be performed to evaluate nodularity both of which were ordered to the patient and both of which were negative. And so the diagnosis for our patient is gestational, transient, thyrotoxicosis. What is the proper management for gestational thyrotoxicosis? Uh, the American Thyroid Association recommends that only supportive therapy should be applied with management of dehydration and hospitalization if needed. Antithyroid drugs are not recommended However, you may resort to beta blockers if they are highly indicated. And this is a strong recommendation. And so our patient received a final diagnosis of gestational transient thyrotoxicosis. Patient received the antiemetic therapy. Vomiting responded gradually to the drugs. Vomiting stopped by the 16th weeks of gestation. And on repeating test on the 18th week of gestation, TSH is back to normal. 3T4 is back to normal. This was a case of gestational transient thyrotoxicosis, which is not to be recommend, which is not uh, recommended to be treated with antithyroid drugs, according to the American Thyroid Association, simply because it is a transient state and it is mediated by the pregnancy-induced uh, elevation of HCG. Again, same set of tests. This time, she is a female, 33 years of age, presented with hair fall and mild weight loss. She sought the advice of a GB. The TSH was suppressed. The free T4 was high normal, a picture consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism. She was prescribed carbimazole 30 milligrams per day. A very common story that I, I see in my clinic every day. One month later, she came back with TSH that is 48 and free T4 that is very low, below normal. She has induced, uh, she has uh, uh, developed iatrogenic hypothyroidism. At this point, she saw the advice of an endocrinologist. She was ordered anti-TBO antibodies, and this was more than 600. She was ordered anti-TG antibodies, more than 4,000, and the TRAB was uh, less than 0.3. So the picture consistent with autoimmune thyroiditis, and the TRAB uh, excludes the possibility of Graves' disease. She was diagnosed retrograde as hashitoxicosis. Carbimazole was stopped. Six weeks later, the TSH was 6.8 and the free T4 was low normal. Three months later, the TSH was slightly higher than normal and free T4 that is within normal, a case of subclinical hypothyroidism. And because there was no clear indication for replacement therapy at the time, she was decided to go on regular follow-up of thyroid function test every six months. So what is Hashitoxicosis? Hashitoxicosis is the transient hyperthyroid state of Hashimoto thyroiditis. It is believed to result from unregulated release of stored thyroid hormones du during the inflammatory mediated destruction of thyroid follicles. Definitely the presenting signs and symptoms of Hashitoxicosis may be very similar to those of Graves' disease. Uh, just to break all the facts, I'm bringing you the uh, United States perspective of this disease. So in the US literature, sometimes they describe Hashitoxicosis as an autoimmune thyroid disease uh, that, that is an overlap syndrome of Graves' and Hashimoto disease. That is 
definitely expected to remit and even to develop hypothyroidism spontaneously. Actually, this perspective is supported by the presence of TSH receptor antibodies positivity in some patients with Hashitoxicosis. I believe this should be classified as something else other than Hashitoxicosis, and this is definitely different than the Hashitoxicosis that I'm discussing today. So do we have a set of diagnostic criteria? I have borrowed this diagnostic criteria from two well-designed researches that were published in the last 10 years. If you have a suppressed TSH, a positive TBO antibodies, a negative TRAP, thyroid enlargement with hypoecogenicity on the ultrasound consistent with autoimmune thyroid disease, you should diagnose your patient as Hashitoxicosis. How frequent is Hashitoxicosis? About 5% of adults and 12% of children may present initially with Hashitoxicosis. So what is the presentation and what would be the proper management? Classically, the patient present with mild or moderate hyperthyroidism, palpation of the thyroid usually reveal a goiter that is firm but not tender, given that beta blockers can be used until the patient reaches an aothyroid or maybe a hypothyroid status. So the utility of autoantibodies in the differentiation, I have told you that it is the trap negativity that holds the promise. Why? Because anti-TBO antibodies can be detected in up to 80% of Graves patients, and definitely it is present in 99% of Hashimoto thyroidized patients, so I cannot use TBO antibodies for differentiation. And the same goes for anti-TG antibodies present in 30% of Graves and 60% of autoimmune thyroidites. It is a fact that 98% of patients with Graves, but it may be also present in up to 6% of Hashimoto thyroidized patients. Still, TRAB negativity is a cornerstone in diagnosing Hashitoxicosis. Thyroid scintigraphy is not useful. In this small series of patients, eight patients, four of which have taken uh, 24 hours urinary, uh, uh, 24 hours radioactive iodine uptake. And two of the four exhibited an increased uptake. So you may have hashitoxicosis with increased diffuse uptake of uh, radioactive iodine. Sonography. So what are the points that we can use in sonography examination to differentiate between Graves' disease and Hashimoto thyroiditis? For the volume for both, they can be normal or enlarged. For the texture, both they would present with hypoecogenicity. For the color doubler, it is usually increased in graves, but it may be normal, uh, uh, reduced or increased in sometimes, but for duplex, it is very highly increased in graves disease, normal or only slightly elevated in a patient with hashitoxicosis. And so you can use the doublers to differentiate between graves in the, uh, in the upper photo. Here you can see what uh, sonographers call uh, uh, the inferno sign. And the below panel shows Hashimoto thyroiditis with no uh, or uh, uh, markedly decreased uh, vascularity. How long would uh, thyrotoxicosis persist in a patient with Hashitoxicosis? So this was a series of eight children, and you can see that it may persist starting from one month and up to uh, 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 six months in this study. In this study, there were 10 children, and again, it persisted up, uh, starting from three months and up to two years. And in a third study, again, it persisted starting from one month and up to two years. So to summarize, Hashitoxicosis presents early in 5% of adults, 12% of children of Hashimoto thyroidites. Differentiation of Hashitoxicosis from Graves' disease is crucial and is achieved by measuring traps to avoid unnecessary treatment with antithyroid drugs. Color flow doubler ultrasound is a supporting aid. Hashitoxicosis resolves spontaneously either to eothyroidism or to hypothyroidism within 1 to 24 months. Only beta blockers are needed in early stages of the disease. One last date of our presentation. 
This was a male patient, 66 years of age. He was diabetic for more than 10 years. On annual routine test, the TSH was markedly suppressed and the free T4 was 1.8, the picture that was sent to you over the WhatsApp to, uh, to seek your consultation. So this is a picture consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism. What should be done in such a patient? According to 2018 European Thyroid Association guidelines for the management of Graves, hyperthyroidism, you should start with the TSH. So if the TSH is normal, this confirms eothyroidism. If the TSH is low or suppressed with a normal free T3 and a normal free T4, this would be classified as subclinical hyperthyroidism. And this is the picture of our patient. If the patient has low or suppressed TSH with uh, normal free T4 and high free T3, this is called T3 toxicosis. This is not our patient. And finally, if it is lower suppressed with high free T3 and high free T4, this is overt hyperthyroidism, and this is not our patient. Our patient is consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism. So how to confirm the etiology of hyperthyroidism in our patient? So in 2018, European Thyroid Association recommended the measurement of TSH receptor antibody. They have described TRABS as a sensitive and a specific tool it can achieve rapid and accurate diagnosis and differential diagnosis of Graves hyperthyroidism. So according also to the recommendations of the European Thyroid Association 2018, you should order TSH receptor antibodies. If it is negative, consider other differential diagnoses of hyperthyroidism, whether this is toxic adenoma, toxic multinodular goiter, or subacute thyroiditis, or school we have explained. If it is positive, this confirms Graves' hyperthyroidism. TRAPS is actually sensitive for the of hyperthyroidism at 98% and specific in 99% of the cases. So is there any aiding investigations that I can use in this situation? Yes, the ultrasound examination is recommended as the imaging procedure to support, to support the diagnosis of Graves two situations. First, if a thyroid nodularity go exists, and second, if you are going to give this patient ablative radioactive iodine therapy. In 2016, the American Thyroid Association, they have mentioned that in order to define the cause of hyperthyroidism, you have to measure TRAB, to uh, perform radioactive iodine uptake, and to perform thyroid ultrasound and thyroid flow study on ultrasounds to differentiate between different causes. However, uh, apart or away from the recommendation, they have mentioned that the measurement of TRAP compared to radioactive iodine uptake reduces the cost of diagnosis by 50% and gives quicker diagnosis in 50% of the cases. For the ultrasounds, can it differentiate between, for example, Hashitoxcosis and Graves' disease? Actually, this is not useful. If you look at the left panel, this is how a normal uh, grade, and it would look homogeneous. While if you look at the right panel, first, there, are, there is marked decreased echogenicity. There's marked decreased echogenicity plus. If you look inside, you would find fibrous septi. These fibrous septi, both right and left, they would give the impression of pseudolopulations and pseudonodule formation. So can I use this to diagnose graves or Hashimoto thyroiditis? Actually, no. From this paper, they have stated that 90% of hypoechogenic glands come from autoimmune disease, most of which is either Hashimoto thyroiditis or Graves' disease. So they have described the classic pattern of thyroiditis, which is marked hypoechogenicity with hyperechogenic fibrocytic septi, while the classic pattern of Graves is, is reduced echogenicity, heterogenicity, and fibrous beams. Actually, they are the same. They are identical, and that's why it is not possible to differentiate between these two diseases using sonography. And as I told you, you are going to uh, perform an isotope scan or scintigraphy only if you have a nodule and this nodule is larger than two centimeters.
What should be the treatment? Treatment of subclinical hyperthyroidism is recommended in Graves patients uh, older than 65 years of age. And antithyroid drugs should be the first choice of treatment of Graves subclinical hyperthyroidism, which applies to our patient. So actually, this is the approach, the stepwise approach for Dominican management. So for a Graves patient, you have to choose between methimazole or carbimazole, radioactive iodine ablation or total thyroidectomy. As you can see, the arrow is much heavier for medical treatment. So this is the first choice. It has to go for 18 months for adults, 36 months for children. If the patient develops serious adverse events, if the patient cannot maintain compliance, or if the patient chooses otherwise, you may go for total thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine ablation. In case of serious side effects of medical treatment or maybe the patient choice, you would go for total thyroidectomy if the patient is presenting with graves of thalmopathy, if the patient presents with concomitant nodules, or if the patient is having a marked goiter. While you would prefer radioactive iodine ablation if the patient doesn't have graves of thalmopathy, doesn't have nodules, and have a small gland. So if the patient with Graves' disease uh, continued, uh, uh, becomes hyperthyroid after completing a first course of antithyroid drugs, then you would give the patient a choice of either going for definitive treatment, radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy ablation, or in 2018, they have mentioned this as an option. Continued long-term, low-dose methimazole can be considered in those who prefer this approach. They also, in the 2018 guidelines, they have mentioned that long-term carbimazole should be considered a satisfactory treatment for older individuals with mild grave disease. So I'm bringing you the updates. This it was mentioned. Uh, this was uh, published um, this month. This was written by George Cahali, the same one that showed the guidelines of Graves' disease in 2018, and actually. Uh, uh, around one year ago, I had this discussion with my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Azzat. Uh, actually, we were discussing the safety of long-term carbimazole for patients with uh, toxic multinodular goiter. This may be a different topic, but uh, it carries uh, some implications to the, to the question that we were discussing at the time. So what were the updates coming from George Kahali published this month, December al Shreem? If biochemical or serological hyperthyroidism persists 18 months after the start of medical treatment, and the same goes for those who relapse after a previous first course of antithyroid drugs, definitely those patients should be offered treatment with radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy ablation. However, adequate and safe alternative, which can be discussed and offered to all Graves' disease patients, is the unlimited continuation of low-dose methimazole. So what is the new evidence supporting this option? First, comparing long versus short-term antithyroid drugs treatment. In Graves' disease patient, treatment for uh, 19 months versus treatment for 95 months. This has resulted in four to five fold increase in the incidence of hyperthyroidism recurrence. So a longer term treatment would produce more lasting uh, uh, remission. Also, they have observed a low incidence of adverse events, uh, events. So for those patients who have maintained carbimazole or methimazole for 95 months, only 1.5% of these patients experienced severe adverse events. So long versus short-term antithyroid drugs, it has some benefit. And then long-term antithyroid drugs versus radioactive iodine ablation. So studies comparing long-term outcomes, treatment of antithyroid drugs for two to 12 years versus going to radioactive iodine ablation, medical treatment has these advantages. Number one, more stable eothyroidism. Number two, a paucity or of antithyroid drug induced adverse events. Number three, lower cost. Number four, less frequent episodes of hypothyroid hypothyroidism. 
Number six, a better remission rates of up to 63%, less weight gain, and less graves of orbitopathy deterioration. So my final slide would be, remember it was the same set of tests in all the situations. They all had a picture consistent with subclinical hyperthyroidism, a suppressed TSH to 0 0.01, and a high normal free T4 of 1.8. And I have shown you that this same test, uh, same set of tests can be interpreted in six different ways. This may be due to biotin interference, which is a lab bit fall, and the first patient did not uh, receive any treatment because actually she was eothyroid. The second interpretation would be iatrogenic suppression in a patient of thyroid cancer. The second patient that I have viewed to you was a patient who had uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma with gross extrathyroidal extension that carries a high risk of recurrence. And this patient is required to be suppressed to TSH below 0.1 while maintaining a normal free T4. And so this patient did not require any modification of the treatment. The third patient that I have showed you was a patient presenting with central hypothyroidism, most probably due to autoimmune hypophysites. In such patients, the target of treatment is different. So we aim for these patients to have a TSH in the, uh, in the higher half of the normal range, a free T4 in the higher uh, half of the normal range, and a TSH that is suppressed to below 0.5 or suppressed to below 0.1 to assure adequate replacement. And again, this patient did not require any modification of the treatment. And then I have presented to you all these treatment and maybe the first example would be Hashitok's causes, which is a tricky diagnosis that has to be differentiated from Graves' disease. If trans confirms this diagnosis, these patients would only require beta blockers if needed, and eventually they would go into eothyroidism or hypothyroidism. Finally, the only situation where the patient actually uh, 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 received treatment is our final patient because our final patient was properly diagnosed as Graves' disease, the only case requiring treatment or a modification of the treatment. So beware of the trap of prescribing medications over WhatsApp. Do not support the folk medicine. And definitely I expect your presence, inshallah, tomorrow for the main event of uh, Virtual Thyro Alex 12, which is also going to start exactly at 8 p.m. Uh, thank you for your presence.